were like, I like your glasses. And I was like, oh, they're blue light blockers. And I'm like, oh, okay. You, usually like people will, so if, if they have an idea that they're blue blockers, they'll ask. And sometimes people will just say, I like your glasses or I like your sunglasses, I think to like start the conversation <laughs> or like, rather than why are you wearing those? <laughs> <laughs> But are they just blue light blockers during the day for PCs or like, I'm assuming it's to block electrical light, right? Yeah. So I, I wear them more at night than anything. Pretty much when the Mm. sun goes down, I try and have them on, especially if I'm looking at my phone, but I try and wear them when I'm on the computer too, honestly. Uh, Okay. But I was going to say, I mean, you're not wearing them then when you're um, uh, like going for a walk out in the countryside or something. No, actually, um, the fellow Dr. Jack Cruz that we have been learning a lot from, he says not to wear them outside. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so you get more natural light. Wow. Hilarious. (laughs) He says not to wear any kind of sunglasses, actually. So I got rid, I mean, I got rid of, but I stopped wearing sunglasses like this past spring. And it was a challenge when we were in Costa Rica for a few weeks because it was like, oh, my God, it's so bright. But it's from what I've been told, it's so important to get light in the eyes And oftentimes when you're wearing sunglasses, your eyes are kind of like what process the light. Mm -hmm. So if you have them blocked with sunglasses, your body thinks it's shady and you're more likely to get sunburned. Isn't that crazy? I've had that as well before. But one thing I will say is that um, it depends because when it's snowy, like, for example, like for Native American and Native Canadian populations, they would often get this thing, and I can't remember what it was called. I think it was called snow blindness. Mm -hmm. And if they were out in the snow because the light's so bright and then you've got the reflection of the snow, they would go blind. So to be honest, I think it's very context dependent. I mean, in the sun, I usually wear a hat anyway. Like, well, I pretty much wear a hat all the time anyway. So I think in that context, it's if it's a sunny day, it's fine. But if there's a lot of snow on the ground and there's really bright sunlight, I always wear sunglasses because it has a very similar feeling if you don't, as if you've been staring at a computer screen all day. Um, So I think he he lives in El Salvador, doesn't he? So that's probably (laughs) less of a concern. Yeah. And here it's like rarely sunny when it snows. Like our winters are so gloomy. Like actually Northeast Ohio is one of the cloudiest places in the country. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Huh. Interesting. (laughs) I wouldn't have thought that. I thought it would have been like less cloudy with the flatlands, but mm. well, there you go. Everybody's following this Dr. Krauss now. Um, Thank you so much for posting your event thing, by the way. So I was just going to say to kick off, we should probably know we've had a nice chat about your sunglasses. So everybody knows why you're (laughs) wearing them. Uh, You might actually want to say who you are and what you do. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Um, So my name is Allison Yancey. I live in Northeast Ohio and um, I offer a lot of wellness things. So anything from um, yoga retreats, wellness retreats, I teach yoga, um, I do personal training, wellness consulting, all of the health related things. (laughs) Nice. And you're a Bitcoiner, we should say as well, because it's a Bitcoin podcast. So very important. Um, And I actually wanted to say to you, I hadn't had a chance to say, but after your class the other day that you did for the Access Tribe members, I mean, it was just amazing the way you tied all the principles of yoga back to Bitcoin. I used to be a yoga teacher, so I've studied two two teacher trainings I did um, covering all the things like Ahimsa and all those different principles. And so I thought that that was an incredible way that you linked it together. And it just gave me pause for thought that everything somehow seems to link back to Bitcoin. (laughs) It does. If if you think hard enough, you can really relate so many things to Bitcoin. (laughs) It's kind of wild. So um, I would actually just really love to kick off talking about your orange pill story. And to be honest, I'd love for you to like maybe rehash some of those thoughts that you did at the start of the class, because it was really mind blowing. So do you want do you want to just like tell your story of how you got into Bitcoin to begin with? Yeah. So in 2017, uh, my fiance, Andrew, his brother was trying to get a fake ID and <laughs> The only way to get the fake ID was to buy it with Bitcoin. So all of the um, things that people say about Bitcoin being for illegal things is, I guess, partially true. (laughs) So anyway, um, he was trying to get this fake ID. Can I just say I made a comment about this the other day on social. I said that uh, criminals are the biggest innovators. (laughs) 
<laughs> so anyway, um, that's kind of how we learned what Bitcoin was. And so we were just like, okay, like it's, you know, some kind of currency. And then um, during 2020, during COVID, Andrew really went down the rabbit hole. You know, we were spending a lot of time at home. We weren't doing much. And he was listening to podcasts, reading books constantly. And I was just kind of like, okay, like it sounds pretty cool, pretty beneficial, you know? And then um, I started really going down the rabbit hole, maybe like 2021. So I would say Andrew learned what Bitcoin was from his brother and the fake ID. And then he's the one who kind of orange pilled me, encouraged me to listen to, you know, some audio books, some podcasts, things like that. And um, yeah, haven't looked back since. Wow. What was it for you that really made the penny drop? Like what was your kind of aha moment? The fact that Bitcoin is finite, um, you know, I think COVID opened my eyes to money a lot because of all of the printing that they were doing and just handing out and then of course inflation. So I think learning that um, there is a cap on Bitcoin was really my aha moment of wow, now this is making sense why people are so far down this rabbit hole and, you know, putting their money into it and have such high hopes for the future. Yeah. What's been the application of it for you then? Because obviously you've spent some time learning about it. You've thought quite deeply about its connection to yoga, but like, how has it kind of impacted impacted you since you discovered it, if you like? Yeah, um, I would say that I have become very much so... Um, I don't know, better at saving, I guess. I guess you could call that, um, you know, you you could refer to like time preference, for example. So um, short time preference is just something that is so related to fiat money, in my opinion, because it's like, how can we spend, 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 and it's only gonna, you know, keep decreasing in value. So I, I think that it's just made me more conscious of um, my future and saving and, low time preference behavior yeah I find those expressions that they use low time preference and high time preference are not very helpful for non-bitcoiners really because it's more like short-term and long-term thinking to me like mm -hmm. I just think that that's a much simpler way of explaining it and we have the terminology anyway but that's yeah it. it's interesting that I, I have a similar kind of perspective where you tend to start thinking much longer term which is usually something that you don't do when you're young anyway you start doing more when you're older but I think generally in an economy where money is depreciating, there isn't much value to hanging on to things. So you just become much more short termist in your in your attitudes, for sure. Yeah, that's really fascinating. How did you become a yoga teacher then? Can you talk about your journey? Because I saw as well, I didn't realize this, but I saw that you'd been a bodybuilder before. And I was like, huh, that's quite a journey. Um, yeah. And did that somewhat coincide with Bitcoin? It did. So, oh, well, not. I wouldn't say coincide with Bitcoin, but the bodybuilding def definitely led me to yoga. So Andrew and I actually met at a gym and everyone thinks that that's so funny when they hear that because we're such fitness enthusiasts, but we met at a gym and I was just kind of showing up to this gym, not really knowing what was going on. I would kind of do the elliptical, do some core stuff, head home. Um, so Andrew really led me down a path of like learning how to lift weights when we were in college. So I got really comfortable going into the weight room at the rec center, the university I was attending, and I loved it. I met a lot of great girls that were also bodybuilding, and I decided to do a show. Um, a lot of people in the fitness community that I knew were doing that, and I was like, I just want to do it for myself to see if I can actually step on stage and do the damn thing. So my senior year of college, my very last semester, only semester I ever got straight A's probably because I was so focused on, you know, class as well as bodybuilding. And I didn't have any time to think about anything else and go out and party like I may have in other semesters. So um, anyway, I did the bodybuilding show. It was a good experience. And I continued, you know, lifting weights and staying active because that's what I love. And Andrew's grandfather got diagnosed with cancer. So he was really close with him and he was understanding that yoga was really great for mental health. So he was like, let's take a yoga class at the gym. And I'm like, okay, 
we, we had taken several fitness classes in our time. So I showed up, I hated it. <laughs> so I was like, what is this? Like, I am very type A, like my energy is always up here. I want to lift weights. When I'm taking a class, I want someone yelling, high beat music, you know, but for whatever reason, I decided to go back, maybe out of support for him, went back and I was like, okay, I kind of liked it. And then I continued to go back to the same teacher. And then I realized like, that's actually what I needed is to slow down, to pause, to find a little bit of stillness in my body, stillness in my day. So then I continued to take classes and Andrew and I decided to sign up for a yoga teacher training at the start of 2016. The studio that we started going to was offering their very first yoga teacher training. So um, it was really cool being part of their very first training and, you know, learning about so many different things. And that was kind of scratching the surface for us. Once we completed that 200 hour, that was kind of where the true journey started. So we found the yoga through the gym and then realized that yoga was so much more than the physical practice. You know, we started studying the eight limb yoga path and taking meditation classes and philosophy, incorporating practices into our lives, such as the yamas and niyamas. And for those who might not know, that's kind of like the ethics of yoga. So there's five of each. Um, some people refer to the yamas as the restraints and the niyamas as the observances. So just incorporating those things into our lives and really making yoga a lifestyle versus just, you know, showing up on the mat, doing a physical practice and going home and still, you know, being pissed off in traffic or whatever. It's, it's really amazing how much meditation has taught me um, when it comes to being patient, you know, not getting angry, asking myself, is this a big problem or is it a small problem? So that was in 2016. Everyone in our training knew that Andrew and I loved to travel. And I didn't remember this until Andrew spoke of it, but one of the mentors in the training was like, oh, like you're going to be teaching yoga around the world one day. And I'm like, I hope so, you know, and because I wasn't really sure where the yoga path was going to take me. And mm. sure enough, I'm recording yoga classes when I travel. We've held a retreat in Costa Rica. We were offering classes in Costa Rica when we were there long-term. So um, having that encouragement from some of the people and mentors from the training was really awesome. Sorry, I was just shutting the curtains because I had like a bright light coming through. <laughs> it disappeared off screen. Um, that's amazing. So how, like, have you incorporated some of the Bitcoin philosophy into yoga in the way that you did for class? Like what, what's been the impact of that or has it impacted what you teach? So I won't lie. I hadn't really thought about how Bitcoin and yoga were related until you asked me to do a Bitcoin yoga class. I'm like, hmm, what does Bitcoin have to do with yoga? And then something that came to my mind at first was proof of work because yoga is a lifelong practice. And I tell people all the time, it's a practice, not a perfect. That's why we show up for ourselves on our mats, you know, each and every day or week or month. And, you know, it, it, it really is proof of work when it comes to health and fitness and yoga and having those practices, it requires a lot of patience. And I find that nowadays, so many people are looking for instant gratification and instant results. And something that Bitcoin has taught me is proof of work. You know, you have to put the work in to get the results. So that was the first thing that came to mind when you had mentioned doing a Bitcoin related yoga class. Yeah, that's right. Actually, it's funny, isn't it? It's quite crazy, but you're right. I love that though. It's a practice, not a perfect. I'm going to, I'm going to steal that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's true actually. It's, it, it's interesting that that the proof of work element does really kind of correspond to that because you're right I think a lot of yoga for many people is quite performative or it's about how you look or that kind of stuff and much less about like the journey that you're taking or where you're trying to get to so it does tie in quite well and um, you're one of the few people that I know that's really kind of a practicing yoga teacher and is a bitcoiner have you had a sense that this community is a bit broader like have you crossed paths with other people who are in a similar space Unfortunately, I haven't. Um, I went to a Bitcoin retreat 
in Michigan back in August. And I connected with a couple of people, mostly women. Um, it was mostly males there, but the few women that were there, I of course connected with because there were so few of us, but that's okay. Um, and one of those people is named Liv and Liv is the one who connected me with Tali. And then Tali is the one who connected me with you. So I have heard a thing for that, but yeah, unfortunately it seems like there's not, um, a whole lot of Bitcoiners in the yoga space, at least not in Northeast Ohio. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, there's uh, DJ Valerie B. Love. Um, I <laughs> she interviewed her for the podcast the other day. That is actually her legal name. She legally changed her last name to B. Love, which I thought was hilarious. Um, mm -hmm. But um, but she teaches yoga. She does kind of meditation stuff. So I'd asked her as well if she wanted to do a session on the platform because I thought that that would be fun. But she's probably the only other person I know that has incorporated that kind of belief system into her, you know, incorporated Bitcoin and yoga together, um, as opposed to just being a Bitcoiner who happens to do yoga on the side. But I do kind of feel like this is a thing now, because now we've got that website slot on the Access Tribe page where we've got all of the female led events and I've started promoting them. I was like, do you know, like almost every girl I know likes to go on a yoga retreat. There's, that's almost like a, a you know, common thread that runs through everybody so I'm like actually if we can combine Bitcoin education with yoga practice that's actually like to me it's like the perfect holiday yeah, <laughs> it is <laughs> so I guess my question is can we make this a thing we sure can <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you're doing a retreat in February is that right you just posted about it a couple of days ago can you talk about those uh, you host them at your cabin in Ohio right can you talk a little bit about that and what those retreats look like yeah, so um, this will actually be my very first time hosting on my own, which is really exciting. Um, I usually partner with my friend who I know from the Northeast Ohio yoga community. So her and I are doing one still in the spring. We usually offer two to three retreats a year in the fall and springtime. Um, but I thought that winter was kind of like a downtime for a lot of people. There's generally not as many events and weddings and, you know, cookouts, things like that. So I thought, why not go for it? So I am hosting one February 23rd to 25th this year. Um, I will have a work trade person kind of helping me, but she'll also be a participant herself. So the weekend will include a lot of yoga. I'm going to offer a breath work workshop. I'm going to offer another workshop that will be revolved around circadian health and longevity. So a lot of the Jack Cruz information, things like grounding, toxic blue light, red light therapy, infrared light, um, the orange glasses, um, and just all kind of circadian health related things. So I'm really excited to plan that workshop and present that to my participants this time. Um, we also will be doing sauna and cold plunge. I'm not going to force anyone, but it is going to be offered. We also will be doing a meditation walk in the woods. So we'll practice silence for a little bit and then we'll break our silence and be able to chat because we're women. I know it's very hard for a lot of people to stay quiet. Funny enough, we had a retreat in October and there were these two women that came together. We practice silence in the mornings as well during these retreats. It's, you know, from timing that we wake up around 7 a.m., usually until about 10 and the one girl was like, yeah, she's been telling people that we're going to a silent retreat <laughs> simply because they had to stay quiet for just a few hours in the morning. So anyway, um, we'll be doing like a potluck on Friday night, all other meals included. Um, we'll be doing a deep relaxation time. We have sharing circles every day. So it's been really great to hold sacred space for people and especially women. Um, it's not common that people have the opportunity to give like 48 hours to themselves, especially surrounded with other women. Most people come on their own, not knowing anyone. Sometimes friends or mother, daughter will come together. But by the end of the weekend, it's really tremendous to see the friendships that have blossomed within such a short time. And, you know, having the support from people that you barely know and having a listening ear and that's really been a passion of mine over the last year and a half is just holding that space for women. Yeah. 
It's funny. I went on a on a vipassana, like a ten day silent meditation meditation retreat. It was almost exactly ten years ago, actually. Um, but it was really funny because um, you know you get so used to this silence, and it goes on for like days and days and days, and you're not speaking, you're not looking at anyone, you're not interacting. And then as soon as it got to the end day, we had like a final session, and then they were like, "Oh, everyone's allowed to speak after a set." <laughs> it was just hilarious. From the second you're allowed to speak, the volume just went. <sighs> Like that <laughs> and everybody had like 10 days of pent up of like I've been surrounded by these people and I haven't been able to talk to them <laughs> yeah just staring at each other like I wonder where they're from what is their background I've stared at you for the last week and a half but I don't know anything about you <laughs> yeah but I will say it was really profound actually it was a super profound experience and it was funny because they take you through all these steps and they tell you like this is more or less how it's going to be and then it ends up being like that like day f- up to day five I think it was you get all the chatter like you suddenly realize that your brain is just on a constant talking to yourself loop like constant and then it sort of goes quiet for a bit and and you so then you sort of have this sort of distress period and then it you kind of come out of it the other side so I found it an incredible experience so I thought that was a, a really nice thing to do so it's great that you've managed to actually incorporate a lot into that 48 hours that's quite profound um are you going to add any bitcoin stuff in then and if you do how are you going to do it <laughs> Good question. So I haven't thought about that yet, but I would love to host a specific Bitcoin women's retreat. So, um, you know, and bring in some of these practices, like I mentioned um, in the yoga class. So, you know, proof of work and how you can bring in the practice of ahimsa, which means compassion or nonviolence or um, even the practice of a prairie which would be non-attachment. So I feel that the yamas and the niyamas could be very much so related to Bitcoin. So it would be very interesting to hold space for women Bitcoiners and really dive deep into how Bitcoin can relate to the practices, maybe do a workshop that's um, about yoga, a workshop that's about Bitcoin. And then, you know, as a group collaborate, like how, how can we incorporate these and I have found that in the Bitcoin space, a lot of people are really into health and nutrition and um, whatever it might be. Not as not as much yoga. That's definitely for sure. Mm-hmm. But it would be really amazing to get together with a group of women Bitcoiners and, you know, go down our own rabbit hole of yoga meets Bitcoin. <laughs> Do you not think though that the like the Bitcoin piece is missing because there are fewer women? Like the men are all like doing their gym pictures and like, look at me, I'm like pumping iron. I think that's hilarious. And like the whole like, <laughs> look at my steak. Look at let's have a little fly fly around me. My steak. Look at my frying pan. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I feel like if this was a women-led movement, there'd be a lot of yoga. <laughs> it's funny because women oftentimes, you know, they are the ones going to yoga. They might not always be the one practicing, but if you go to a class, there's almost always more women than men. So, and that's kind of the opposite when you go to Bitcoin meetups, Bitcoin conferences, retreats, whatever it might be. So I think that that, that could potentially be why yoga and Bitcoin haven't like intersected quite yet with the people um, because the Bitcoin world is so male dominated, whereas the yoga world I don't want to say it's female dominated because a lot of what yoga came from was invented by males, but most people nowadays don't know that. So they think, oh, like that's for women, like they're just stretching or, or whatever it might be. And most people who say things like that don't have a full understanding of the practice and that's okay. That's where they are on their journey. But yeah. 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 I I was thinking it's really funny when you get like men who are gym bunnies and come, they come to yoga classes and it's like, ugh. (laughs) One of my favorite things, honestly, <laughs> I love when bodybuilders come to my, it's been a while since I've had like a big beefy dude come to my yoga class, but I have plenty of times and yeah, they, it's, it's interesting to watch. Sometimes their ego gets in the way of the practice or they might muscle themselves into things that they maybe shouldn't be doing if it's their first yoga class. But I always tell people, this is your practice. This is your journey. So take what you need. And I will never discourage people from trying something, but it is fun to see. And it's, it's kind of like an eye opener when males come to yoga sometimes, because they have this perception of what it is and who it's for this, that, the other, but 
then they actually do. And they're like, wow, like I feel really good. Or I have, you know, a lot of flexibility to work on. And I have found that in my fitness journey, yoga has helped me so much. I mean, I barely knew how to breathe in the gym. And once I learned how to breathe correctly and diaphragmatically breathe in my yoga practice, it took my workouts to the next level. Yeah. Do you still lift weights? I do. You do? Oh, that's interesting. Because I was looking at the pictures of you on Instagram and I'm like, oh my God, this is so aspirational. Look at her stomach. <laughs> it's like, a, it's, it's not even flat. It's like ripped. And I was like, damn. <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> I'm well, glad to hear that that's not just yoga because I was like yeah my yoga practice isn't doing that for me <laughs> <laughs> yes I'm still very passionate about weightlifting I probably lift weights about four or five times a week um it's honestly a lot more mental than physical at this point kind of kind of like yoga I mean I, I love to feel strong too um it's so funny when I'm around family members and you know someone's asking me to like move something or I was helping my mom with Christmas decorations, bringing big totes up from the basement, bringing them back down. And she's like, Oh my gosh, you're carrying two of those. Like you're going to hurt yourself. I'm like, mom, I could be holding five of these and not hurt myself. You know, like, this is why I go to the gym. Like I of yeah. course like to look strong, but I also like to use my, my strength for functional things, just simply moving things or just making my life easier. And I know a lot of women that have babies are always like, Oh, like I need to gain some upper body strength so I can carry this baby around this or that, you know, my sister recently had a baby about six months ago and man, he's, he's a chunky man and he's getting heavier by the day. And she's like, Oh my gosh, she's so heavy. And I'm like, you know, let's, let's get you working out a little bit. And so, you know, carrying him around isn't such a challenge. And I'm working with a girl right now. And she's like, when I go up the steps with him, you know, he's 30 pounds and it's getting easier because I'm getting stronger. And that's what I love to hear. Yeah. Have a baby. If you want good upper body strength, is that the, that's the takeaway. <laughs> <laughs> you have no choice, but to gain some upper body strength. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, I think definitely incorporating the Bitcoin and the yoga. I mean, like you're right, nobody else is really doing it. And like, you're the first person that I've come across that was actually able to kind of since, since, size that really well so there's definitely a market for it I mean I was thinking about that even at Bitcoin Nashville it'd be great if you could just host it like a public yoga class that people could just rock up to like be they male or female but it'd be really nice to have something like that I just think it would add an additional layer to the conference that makes it a bit more participatory I went to consensus and I didn't actually end up joining any of them but they did have uh, Barry's boot camp type things every morning so I'd signed up for a few of them and then it just ended up that I wasn't able to attend because I had a coffee with somebody or whatever but it'd be a great thing I'd love to see that actually we should we should propose it to them <laughs> it can happen yeah yeah because I think enough of us are going as well specifically in in our group now our, our women's group um yeah. but that I think we we would certainly all want to go to your class and do that at the at the actual conference so yeah maybe we should we should send them a note and say can they add that to their schedule <laughs> Good, because I feel like when you go to long weekend events like that, it's just so go, go, go. And the only time you really get to like pause and breathe is if you're maybe eating a meal or bedtime. And mm. I tell people this all the time. I work with some people in the corporate space and I say, treat this as a pause in your day when we get to Shavasana, because it's not often that you get to like lie down on your back with your eyes closed for five to 10 minutes in the middle of your work day. And the same could probably be said in a weekend long conference where there's workshops and speakers and it's just constant interaction, which is very draining for a lot of people, including myself at times. So that could be a great way to get people to slow down a little bit and find a little bit of stillness within their wild weekend. Yeah, totally agree. I think it'd be a great addition. Um, and we're still specking out our weekend, aren't we? Are you going to make the Yucatan event, by the way, the one in Mexico, do you think? I haven't given Tali a for sure answer yet. Um, I'm hoping to, but I believe we're going to El Salvador for a couple of weeks in February, and then we're getting married in November of next year. So oh. We'll see what happens. I'm also in two other weddings next year. One of them is my sister's. So bachelorette parties and showers and all the wedding things next year for myself and two other people. So we will see. If not, I know it's going to be an amazing event. Tali has done 
so much work to put the events together and each day like she was as she was going through each day when she was talking to us that day on zoom I was like oh my gosh that sounds like so much fun and then this oh my gosh that sounds like so much fun yes it's actually mad I didn't realize that she had uh done so much programming I mean it's a beautiful schedule so I have to go to a wedding in April so I don't know if it's too close but if it's not I definitely want to go I'm just looking at what the dates are again because I think she had posted them on on the Bitcoin Yucatan just so we've got the uh the whole I have to tell her actually to put it on the header yeah she's got beautiful pictures as well for every single day with everything that's that's going to be happening um day three yeah I was just trying to see it's March I want to say it's March 12th to 16th but uh let's see days two and five sorry I'm just scrolling through why am I doing this live I don't know why I'm doing this live (laughs) sorry 16th 16th to the 22nd um of March is is the session um, in Merida, Mexico, so it's just just near Yucatan. Um, and actually, for anyone listening, that's Bitcoin Yucatan is the handle on X slash Twitter. Um, what's yours again? Um, can you give the the? Is it? Have you got it on your optimum optimal wellness handle? What's that? My retreat. Yeah. So my retreat is a women's. Winter Women's Wellness Weekend, I believe is what it's called. And it is on my Twitter, it's on Instagram, and it's on my website, which is optimalwellness.health. Okay. And what are the dates for that again? The 23rd to the 25th. And then the spring retreat, which I will be partnering with someone for, is May 3rd to 5th. Okay, perfect. And what, um, how many spaces do you have on that? Like if people want to book and come, how many spaces are available and what are the accommodations? Yeah. So for the women's winter weekend, I believe I can have up to like six or seven. So in the spring and fall time, we can have people glamping and camping. So we are able to have more participants. So what I said, I'll be coming with my dogs. Yes, (laughs) please. I would love that. Um, And that's, the spring one we call wild women's yoga retreat. So um, that's always really fun. We have some great activities planned for that as well. Um, it's a similar schedule to the winter one, but a little bit different. And my friend Paisley brings a lot to the table when it comes to Ayurveda and she plays the harmonium. It's more yoga focused than just wellness. But um, I don't know where I was going with that. What was your original question? Um, I was just asking you what the accommodations were. So like, if you can have seven people, like what are the sleeping arrangements, I guess? Yeah. So, um, I have a giant couch, the big sectional, and it's like the most comfortable couch you've ever sat on. It literally will suck you in, but that is an accommodation as well as, um, we have a couple of air mattresses. So those are more of like the common space, a little more budget friendly. And then we have two bedrooms with queen beds. So, um, could put two or one people in those bedrooms. And then for the spring retreat, we also have the glamping option, which is in the enclosed porch. So you still have electric. We usually put heaters out there. You still have lights. If you want lights, you can charge your phone, all that kind of stuff. And then we have a couple of camping spots and my friend Paisley has a tent. It's like a roof nest tent that sits above her Subaru Outback. And I believe that one is already sold out. It's always one of the first ones to go because it's such a unique experience. So, um, We have anything from camping to glamping to sleeping inside on the shared space or having a private or shared bedroom. Wow. Oh, that sounds incredible. How much fun. (laughs) It is so much fun. I mean, so many people show up and they're like, I was so nervous or I didn't know what to expect. And, you know, I got so much out of this and it was so much fun. And, you know, I have so many things to take home with me and, you know, it's just, it's very uplifting and it's so much about women empowerment and active listening skills, no judgment, no ego, and just connecting with other women, which I don't think we do enough. And at one of the retreats, people kept saying sorry for the silliest things. And we literally made it a rule that you can't say sorry anymore. (laughs) Like, like, oh, like I stepped on the corner of your yoga mat. I'm so sorry. Or "I, I was in your way. I'm so sorry. Like we're not you're not allowed to say sorry anymore this weekend because 
we as women are always saying sorry and are always apologizing. And you know what? That weekend we weren't. We were just kind of. I feel. I feel like that. That's a very British and Canadian trait. If you have British and Canadian people, they're like British people say sorry all the time. Like somebody yeah. walks into them on the street and they're like, "I'm sorry." Yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah. like a cultural reflex. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Um, can I ask you about El Salvador then? Because you've been there a fair bit and you're a Bitcoiner and you're a yoga teacher and, and there's quite a scene there as well. I feel like just a bit more of, um, I don't want to call it like an alternative lifestyle, but a healthy lifestyle um, attitude there. Can you talk a bit about your experiences there and, and do you plan to spend a significant amount of time there? Yeah, so I had an opportunity to go to El Salvador in February of this year. So I talked Andrew into going to Guatemala first. And at first he was kind of like, I don't know, like it is right there, but it's kind of out of the way. But the the thing that really sold him is we were able to go to Lake Atitilan, which is also known as Bitcoin Lake or Lago Bitcoin. So that was really cool because that was like our first dive into, you know, a more Bitcoin circular economy. And then we made the trek over to El Salvador and we were there for almost the whole month of February. And it is a healthy lifestyle in the sense of like, life is just simple there. Mm. You can't, you know, I, I take for granted some of the things that like I can get at any time here because we have such great restaurants and grocery stores and things like that. But even things like cooking and grocery shopping are just more simple there. Um, I always find myself coming home much healthier and looking more fit because I'm eating what's growing down there when I, when I travel to Central America, but um, the people are so welcoming. I have loved spending time at the Hope House which if you're not familiar, um, the Hope House has been around for, I believe, about 15 years and they work a lot with children. So they offer English classes, they offer technology classes, and then they want to get the kids moving. So we had the opportunity to work with kids in El Zante, as well as some other um, villages nearby where they wanted the kids to exercise. So I actually led a couple of workouts my spanish is not that good but good enough to at least you know lead a workout class by counting and saying stop and go and that was a blast um we <laughs> we can really up the ante here it's going to be a bitcoin yoga class in spanish, in spanish. <laughs> <laughs> that's the goal honestly if i could lead a whole spanish or a whole yoga class in spanish that I, I would be very proud of myself. My my Spanish is poquito right now. So same. Um, I mean, I speak Italian, so it's like it, it's similar. But I, I did some Spanish lessons years ago in London because I was covering Spanish clients for work, and and the bank I was working at were like, "Oh, we'll pay for you to have lessons." But my Spanish teacher used to say to me, "You think you're speaking Spanish, but what you're doing is you're speaking Italian." <laughs> you think you're speaking Spanish <laughs> you know I just add like a little flourish at the end that made it sound <laughs> Spanish and he's like no <laughs> <laughs> I love that it's so funny too because I can say enough phrases to you know ask a, a child what their name is what their favorite color or favorite animal you know what do you like to do things like that so they automatically think I speak Spanish and so they'll start going on a tangent and I'm just nodding my head see <laughs> see <laughs> so yeah. I think I think actually Latin American Spanish I find a lot easier to to understand than Spanish Spanish um it, they're there there's less th -th and and they seem to speak a little bit slower so things are a bit more enunciated um so I think it's just easier for a foreigner to to grasp that when I'd go to Spain this was part of the problem as well is that I could speak to them in Italian and they would understand me perfectly. And then they'd respond in Spanish. It was really quick. It was just like, there's a bit of that. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> too much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. I, I have a lot to learn. Let's say that. But, you know, proof of work. <laughs> <laughs> and I so what, you, <laughs> what I was going to say, I mean, do you think then that it might be like a thing to split your time between the two regions and maybe focus on teaching yoga out there? Is that is that what you're thinking or? I don't know whether you can say, have you made your plans even? Is there anything yeah, you can share? 
<laughs> it's hard to say at this moment. Um, however, we are definitely looking for a place to go to when it is cold in Ohio. Um, for a long time, that place was Costa Rica, and we had actually made a down payment on a piece of property there and then decided to pull out because it wasn't exactly what we were looking for. And as we continued to go back, we were kind of falling out of love with the town that we were once very in love with. And people are always asking like, when are you going back to Costa Rica? And we're like, we're going to El Salvador now. So um, even though we've only been there once, it was for about a month. So we got a good taste of what the country is like. Um, we were in a few different places. And like I said, the people there are so welcoming. We loved working with the kids. Um, we're really into, you know, the sun and the warm weather and grounding. And there's so much of that to be done on the beaches of El Salvador. And I don't know, just getting in the water, being at the beach for sunrise. It's incredible how much more motivated I am to get out of bed for a sunrise when I'm in Central America versus when I'm in Ohio. Um, and I don't know, I spend so much time outside there and I just feel like I'm living my best life while I'm there when it comes to health, wellness, fitness, um, giving back to the community, um, connecting with people, trying new foods. So, and then of course, Bitcoin. Um, that's pretty much what brought us to El Salvador, even though we kind of knew how much we loved Central America. That's definitely what brought us to El Salvador and will continue to bring us to El Salvador. But now that we know how special of a country it is, I mean, there's no reason not to go back. So many people have expressed concern for safety and things like that. And from my understanding, they say that El Salvador is the, the safest country in Central America now. And statistically, say, it's actually safer than Canada now. So I believe it. And I always tell people like no one bats an eye if I say, oh, I'm going to Chicago. And I mean, it's it's very unsafe in some parts of Chicago nowadays, but you know, the minute I say I'm I'm going to El Salvador, they're like, oh my gosh, you know, like you really gotta watch. And I'm sure if if there's tr if you want trouble, you can find it. But um, from my experience there, I've always felt very safe. Um, and I have all all good things to say about El Salvador, honestly. Yeah. What's the community like then? I mean, does the expat community tend to like hang out together quite a lot, I guess, because of the language barriers and, and, and is it very like expats? Is it very Bitcoin expats? Like what's the, the division of, of uh, what are the, the cliques, shall we say? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's people from all over there, which is one of the reasons I love to travel. I, I love to meet people from all over the world, but um. I mean, there's, you can definitely tell the locals from the expats or, or tourists, but um, like we met some people when we were taking a yoga class. Um, there's a girl down there named Alexandra. She goes by um, Zante Yoga and she uh, teaches yoga down there. She does yoga retreats down there, things like that. So it was cool to be able to interact with her. I believe she's been down there since. Is she a Bitcoiner as well? I want to say she's not actually. So she's been down there for like 13 to 15 years. I mean, she might be, you know, somewhat into it now. She's actually originally from Canada. Oh, are you serious? Wait, is she, when you say she goes by Zonta Yoga, do you mean on Twitter? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't or find Instagram. her. Instagram. Uh, maybe it's Instagram then. Yeah, it could be Instagram. Yeah, I <laughs> connected with her before I went down there because I had a friend that was um, teaching English down there at one point. This is before Bitcoin was legal tender and everything like that. And she had told me about the yoga class and I was oh. like, oh, with her. So it was cool to have that um, recommendation by a friend here in Ohio and then actually go down there and meet her in person and take her yoga class. Huh. Oh, so that's really interesting. So she's lived through seeing it before and after. What was her her perspective on that you know I don't know that I really had the opportunity to ask her um yeah I don't I don't I don't know her perspective on all of that I know that she comes back to Canada um during the summertime so she can see family and things like that but I think she's pretty stationed there like I said she's been there definitely for over a decade but I want to say more like 13 to 15 years so she definitely has seen oh. it go from 
you know, very small town as far as El Zante goes and, you know, maybe not as safe to being a very safe place to visit. So, yeah. Huh. So if people were interested in moving down to Central America and they're looking for a location, then would you say that El Salvador is a good option? And if the answer is yes, where would you suggest that they they go? I know it's small, but. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I would say El Salvador is a great option. Um, it's still very affordable. Um, like I said, the people are very welcoming. And un unfortunately, I've been to other places in Central America where the locals aren't extremely happy to see you. They're more likely to steal your things, you know, just petty theft. And I never really got that vibe while being in El Salvador. And I, I never got a single thing stolen there. And Andrew and I have unfortunately had a lot of things go missing or stolen in Costa Rica, um, which is very unfortunate. Oh, really? Huh. Well, in the hotel, you mean? I mean, so many, unfortunately, many places. And I mean, we know better now to like not leave anything on the beach for more than a couple of seconds because people are watching at all times. And if there's an opportunity for them to take something from a tourist, they're probably going to hop on that. And, you know, that's not all of Costa Rica, but in, in some towns that unfortunately is the case and that doesn't take away from the nature and the beauty of the country and I will definitely continue to travel there but in my opinion I think El Salvador would be a better choice um, like I said it's more affordable the people are very welcoming I think that they're excited that they are living in a country that people want to come visit now because that definitely was not always the case and I think that they're appreciative for people like us coming and volunteering and supporting their community and you know going out to eat in the restaurants and supporting the local people and spending our bitcoin there and keeping their economy going yeah what's the best time of year to go there then i mean and and if one was going say to visit would is is it kind of most advisable to stay down at the beach in el zonte or would you say to go to san salvador like what's the best location so I'm a beach person. So I love El Zante. Um, when we were there, we were at the beach every single day. Like we pretty much mm. saw every sunrise and sunset while there. Mm. So we stayed in El Zante area for about two weeks. And then we went to La Libertad, which um, is a little bit closer to like El Tunco. And we did visit El Tunco as well. We did not stay there, but we were in more of like a local community. So it was kind of cool because El Zante had a lot more tourists and we met people from all over. And then we were kind of like in this little local village that was literally a, a surf shack on the beach. I tell everyone it was like a glamping experience because um, it was all open air. So that was definitely very um humbling but those are the two main places we have stayed um we are hoping to explore some of the mountains next time we go back mm. um i've heard a lot of great things specifically from dr jack cruz about the area in the mountains and how you don't need the air conditioning at night and how the water is really cold and you can get like your cold exposure and things like that up there which we are very much so into so it's hard to say what the best place to live would be, but my draw to go back right now is definitely El Zante because we like the beach, we surf a little bit, and we loved working with the Hope House and the kids there. And I don't know, just giving back a little bit, it kind of gave us a purpose when traveling there versus, you know, focusing on work back home or just feeling like we were in vacation mode per se. And I don't know, just meeting people that we literally never would have met and going down there, we knew that we wanted to try and work with the Hope House a little bit by doing something. We didn't know what. And when I reached out, they never got back with us, never got back with us. And I'm like, oh, like, this is a bummer. Like, maybe we should just show up and we showed up. There was no one there. And the one day we happened to be walking by the Hope House and I won't lie, El Salvador and really a lot of places in Central America, there's a lot of trash a lot of litter, unfortunately. So when we have some time and we're just walking around, like we'll bring a trash bag from our Airbnb and just pick up a little bit, just, just to help, just to do our part. We were doing that and we happened to start coming up on the Hope House and um, Chimbera, who's one of the founders of Bitcoin Beach, he was like, 
hey, what are you guys doing? Or like, you know, picking up trash. And he's like, do you want to go pick up trash on another beach? And we're like, (laughs) okay. (laughs) I tell people this. I'm like, yeah, we just got in the back of this guy's truck and went down the road. (gasps) They're like, what? I'm like, yeah. Did Did you know who he was? Andrew did I didn't oh okay so it's not like a total oh. rando yes. <laughs> we're like sure we not? just got in the back of this guy's truck this is how like tourist stories go wrong <laughs> yeah yeah so um we met some other tourists um two from France and then one who was from Australia but I believe he was living in New York City and he goes down to El Salvador like every winter and So it felt like a little less sketchy since there were other volunteers there. And that was the first opportunity we had to work with the kids. So that first time was not in El Zante, but we were able to go to another beach and, um, you know, talk with the kids a little bit. And we picked up trash before doing the physical activity stuff. So that was really awesome. I don't know that they were planning to pick up trash, but I think since he saw us, he went and grabbed a bunch of bags we went to that beach and the kids helped us pick up trash. And like I said, it's, it's a pretty big problem down there. So we hope to have made an impact on the kids there and maybe they'll be a little bit more mindful of um, where they're putting their trash and just cleaning up their community for themselves. And do you know that's so funny though, because in India, it's the opposite. There's no trash anywhere because everyone's so poor that they recycle everything. Like there is not a thing that goes on the ground that doesn't get recycled. So it's interesting that they have a trash problem in El Salvador. Um, yeah. Cause they're obviously not finding uses for these things that they could otherwise be kind of repurposing. Yeah. And unfortunately it's a lot of like just garbage food that comes in plastic. Ah, uh, so right. It's, I, I feel that maybe uh, they're taking on some of our bad habits when it comes to eating and then just kind of throwing it on the ground, unfortunately, because a lot of what they sh- like, you know, normally would be eating would be things like bananas, which you can just throw the banana peel and the, the lizard's going to eat it or it's going to compost and give you some really nice soil. <laughs> the lizard's going to eat it. I love it. <laughs> a, Salvador lizard. a whole banana from me when I was there. A, a lizard. Lizard. I had I had a banana like sitting on a log at the beach. And this thing kept creeping up and Andrew had to scare it off. I'm like, okay, I just need to eat this banana because it kept creeping over to try and steal my banana. And I have had a banana stolen from me from a monkey before. And I was like, not again. <laughs> this is not going to happen again. But they will eat just the peel. So I ate the banana through the peel in the in the woods and it, I think it came back for it. Oh, I see. So the peel is like peel is good enough for them as well. Yeah, my mum lived in India for a year and she was telling me about a story. One of her colleagues said that he'd come home and he'd opened the front door and a, a monkey had got into his house. And he said, look, if a monkey gets in your house, you leave like because they're they're you know, they're quite aggressive. But uh-huh. he walked through this his front door of his house and this monkey sat there on his table and he had a bowl of um, mangoes and the monkey just picks up the mangoes and starts throwing them at him. <laughs> No, <laughs> I would not know. I mean, India is actually the place where my banana got stolen. <laughs> and this monkey saw me carrying a banana and like a little bag and it swatted the bag out of my hand and all, all the things in my bag went on the ground and it picked up my banana and ran away with it. <laughs> so that really does not surprise me because they are very smart and mischievous. <laughs> Oh my God, that's so funny. I was in a park when I was there when I went to visit her and I was, uh, this is just like funny things with traveling, but I saw this monkey in the park and he'd found like a discarded carton of juice that somebody hadn't finished it. So it still had the straw in it and there was a carton of juice. And so he'd picked it up and he was drinking his juice carton through the straw. And so I'm like, oh my God. And I get out my camera to take a photo of him and I'm like, this is hilarious. And then these three kids appear in front of me and they all stand there with their backs to the monkey and they were looking at me and pointing at me like I'm the oddity and I'm like there's a darn monkey behind you drinking out of a juice carton and I'm the interesting thing yeah <laughs> they're used to seeing that apparently <laughs> I know so it's just funny because I've got this photo of like the monkey standing there with a the juice carton and then three kids with their backs to him just looking at me like pointing <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't see this every day <laughs> 
so funny. Oh my God, well, that's really interesting. It's such a great insight into El Salvador. Well, I hope when I eventually make it down there that I'll get to see you there. So that would be really cool. And yeah, gosh, I mean, best of luck with that. But I feel like there might be a future life for you at least half the year there teaching yoga. I mean, it just feels like an awesome thing to be doing in the Bitcoin community as well. So congrats for occupying this space now that was lying vacant. And uh, and here's to you doing a big yoga session or two at the Nashville uh, conference, I think. I think we need to get that happening. Let's make it happen. Definitely. Well, I mean, I guess just before we drop off, Alison, could you share all of your social links? So your website, your Instagram and Facebook, 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 if you have it and your Twitter slash X optimal wellness and um, your personal links. Yeah. So my website is optimalwellness.health. And that's where you can find all of the things. I have a yoga subscription. I've got some free yoga videos on there. I do email blasts once a month, so you can sign up for that. I have all previous email blasts on there, and I've talked quite a bit about some of the things mentioned in today's podcast, anything yoga-related, um, grounding, a lot of the doc Dr. Jack Cruz info. Um, and then I just started using Twitter again. Um, and I, as you know, I changed my handle to Bitcoin Yogini. So that's kind of like my Bitcoin social media. And I've been connecting with a lot of great people that are educational and doing great things in the Bitcoin space on there. And then my Instagram is a underscore Y-A-N-C-I 11. Last name is Yancey. A lot of people ask me how that is pronounced. And then I also have a business page, which is just optimalwellness.health on Instagram, which is the same as my website. Okay, perfect. Cool. Well, that's amazing. Well, thank you so much. Best of luck with the winter retreat. And um, and yeah, I look forward to lots more Bitcoin yoga. And just thank you so much for everything you're doing in this space and for the class you did for us on Access Tribe. That was amazing. Absolutely. Thank you so much for asking me to be on here. It's been great. I really enjoy listening to your podcasts and who you have on here. So it was an honor. <laughs> Thank you. Likewise. Thank you.